Today on the Perception in Action podcast, the first episode in a two-part series looking at the contributions of Paul Fitz to our understanding of motor control and motor learning. What is Fitz's law? How can it be used to understand and predict speed accuracy trade-offs in sports? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to begin a series looking at the contributions of Paul Fitz. I talked a little bit about his work way back in episode 8, when looking at the very influential Fitz and Posner model of skill acquisition. I'll be diving into that more in the next episode, but today I want to start with his other major contribution, Fitz Law. Think about that name for a second. How often do we argue and debate theories and results in motor control? To have something people are willing to agree is a law is a pretty significant achievement. So what exactly is this law, and how can we take it from simple laboratory tasks to more complex sports movements? After an early career in the Air Force and Civil Service, Paul Fitz worked as a professor at The Ohio State University. In his work in the 1950s, he was interested in understanding the performance capacity of our motor system. In particular, he was interested in explaining how and why our performance changes as a function of the task demands. If I ask you to throw a ball to a large target, then switch to a smaller one, it's likely you will reduce the speed of your throw. If I ask you to make a simple movement like touching a button, then switch to a more complex one, it's likely your movement time will be longer. There are trade-offs in performance. As we make a task more difficult in some way, there will be associated change in how we execute the movement to satisfy the new task constraints. These are facts of life. But are the changes that occur in performance in response to task demand changes completely random? Or are they systematic in some way? Can we predict how you will adjust something like the speed of a throw or the movement time if we change the task conditions in a certain way? When Fitz was working on this in the 1950s, there was a lot of disconnected work showing what seemed to be like very different effects of the amplitude, duration, and variability of movements depending on the particular study you looked at. Fitz recognized that these things might all be interrelated and sought to unify the field in some way. He really had two major innovations in addressing this question. The first was, like many good scientists, instead of trying to build a completely new theory and model, he looked to other areas for ones that had already been established. In particular, he had the novel insight of bringing information theory to motor control. Information theory was developed by Shannon in 1948 as an attempt to understand how signals are communicated and transmitted. Fitz essentially created a measure of the amount of information carried in a movement, which I'll describe shortly. He hypothesized that if we measure the performance capacity of the human perceptual motor system in these information units, this capacity would be relatively constant for a range of different task conditions, like speeds, distances, etc. The second major innovation Fitz had was in coming up with a methodology to address these questions. Most of the experimental paradigms at the time involved participants reacting to a stimulus, such as a light turning on or a sound. In his first set of experiments, Fitz wanted to take this perceptual component out of the equation and just look at spontaneously produced movements. But how do you let someone produce their own movement and systematically vary task difficulty? To do this, he came up with what is now known as the Fitz pointing task a simple but elegant way to get at the question of performance capacity of the human motor system. So let's dive into all of this in more detail. In his now famous 1954 paper, Fitz conceptualized movements in terms of information. Quote, The information capacity of the motor system is specified by its ability to produce consistently one class of movement from among several alternative movement classes. The greater number of alternative classes, the greater is the information capacity of a particular type of response. End quote. In other words, the more complex the movement, the more information it carries. To quantify the information carried in a movement, Fitz developed a measure, fashioned on information theory, he called the index of difficulty. There are slight variations in the formulation now, but the basic measure is index of difficulty equals log base 2 
of 2D divided by W, where D is the distance of the target that the performer is trying to move to, and W is the target's width. The units of this measure are bits, which comes from information theory. Without going into all the math and the theory, let's try to understand this equation. The information carried in a movement increases with the index of difficulty. This index of difficulty of movement increases when D increases. So the further you have to move, the more difficult a movement becomes. That makes sense. Kicking a 45-yard field goal in football obviously places much greater demands on movement coordination than kicking a 10-yarder. At the same time, the index of difficulty decreases as W increases, because it's on the bottom of the equation. That is, the wider the target, the less difficult the movement. That makes sense too, right? If I double the width of the field goal uprights, it would place less demands on coordination of field goal kicking, no matter what distance you are at. So in sum, if you want to remember a shorthand for the index of difficulty equation, it is essentially just the distance divided by the width of a target. In FIT's information signal analogy, D is the signal we're trying to communicate, while W is the noise, or tolerance, or margin for error. The wider the target, the more noise will be tolerated in our movement execution because there's a greater margin for error. Okay, that is step one. Next, remember Fitz's hypothesis. The performance capacity of our motor system should be roughly the same as long as the information carried in the movement, as measured now by the index of difficulty, is the same. The aspect of performance Fitz was interested in in his first set of experiments was the time required to make a movement what we commonly call now movement time, which is the time duration between the initiation of a movement and hitting your target. So now we can relate these two things. Fitz proposed the following relationship. Movement time equals A plus B times the index of difficulty. That, my friends, is the famous Fitz law. Again, without going into all the math, what we have here is a law stating that movement time increases linearly with index of difficulty. Fitz hypothesized that this simple relationship should capture variation in movement times for a wide range of task conditions involving different distances and widths of targets. To test these ideas, he used three different experiments in his 1954 paper. In experiment one, participants were asked to tap two metal plates mounted on a table using a stylus, with the distance between the plates and their width manipulated. There were four different distances and four widths for a total of 16 different conditions when you combine them all. Participants could move at whatever rate they wanted between the plates, but were given the goal of hitting as many targets as possible while emphasizing accuracy rather than speed. Experiment two involved taking small discs off a vertical pin and transferring them to another pin, while experiment three was the same thing but moving small pins. What was found? In all three experiments, participants made very few errors, but there were clear effects on movement time. If we look at just experiment one, movement time increased with increased distance between the plates and decreased as the width was increased. If you just look at movement times for the different conditions, there seems to be no real pattern there. But if instead, as Fitz did, you express each condition in terms of the index of difficulty, the movement time, is, as he predicted, highly predictable. In a nutshell, the two main findings of Fitz's 1954 study are, first, movement time increases linearly as a function of task difficulty, as measured by the index of difficulty. So in other words, more difficult or complex movements require a longer time to execute. And second, if you manipulate task difficulty in different ways, for example, increasing the distance or making the width of a target smaller, if these both result in the same amount of information, or index of difficulty, they will have the same exact effect on movement performance. So using my football example again, increasing the distance of a field goal will have similar effects on movement execution as narrowing the width of the uprights, as long as the index of difficulty remains the same. In a follow-up paper published in 1964 with co-author James Peterson, Fitz extended these findings to a more discrete movement task which involves participants moving to one of two targets when they lit up. Again, the distance to the targets and their width was varied. What was found? Again, movement time was strongly related to the index of difficulty, thus fitting nicely with Fitt's law. Interestingly, there was no relationship between reaction time, which of course is the time between the light going on and the participants starting their movement, 
and the index of difficulty. Foreshadowing later work, including some of my own, Fitz concluded, quote, apparently reaction time reflects the time required for a perceptual or cognitive processes and is determined in part by the preparations which the participant makes prior to the stimulus coming on, such as those resulting from his knowledge of stimulus probabilities. Movement time, in contrast, appears to reflect the duration of motor system processes that are necessary for the control of the timing and the patterning of movement, and which begin after the decision is made to execute the movement, end quote. Like many great discoveries, Fitt's law seems like a pretty simple idea now, but it's quite astonishing how this basic rule of movement has mostly stood the test of time for over 50 years, with people trying it in various other scenarios. Subsequent research, which you can read about in the articles I've linked in the show notes, has found some interesting subtleties to the patterns Fitz observed. For example, even though they have equivalent effects on movement time, research looking at movement kinematics has shown that target distance and target width affect kinematics in different ways. For example, distance seems to have more of an effect on the initial phase of movement, in particular when the peak velocity is reached. But either way, Fitt's law was a monumental achievement in bringing together a large number of disparate findings related to movement and task difficulty. One area where we do see a somewhat different pattern to Fitt's law is when temporal requirements of a task are varied instead of spatial requirements. This can be seen in some really nice work by James Trezillian and colleagues. In his basic task, which he calls one degree of freedom hitting, participants are required to move bats of different sizes along a track to strike objects of different sizes that are moving at different speeds. So similar to Fitz experiments, we have objects of different sizes, and therefore different tolerances or margins for error, but they're moving now. As an equivalent to Fitz's index of difficulty, Trezillian used a simple formula to quantify the time window in which successful interception can occur. This depends on three things, the speed of the moving object, the width of the object, and the length of your bat. Think about if you are given the task of knocking a ball out of the air with a bat. If the ball is moving very fast, the time window is small. That is, the period over which you can move and still be successful is small because it will be only near your body for a very short time. Or in other words, it requires a precision strike. If we make the object larger, say it's a beach ball instead of a baseball, it's going to take some time for the full width of the ball, from its leading edge to the trailing edge, to pass by your body. So even if it's at the same speed, the time window would be larger. Finally, of course, the time window is going to depend on the length of your bat in his experiments. The longer it is, the less precision will be required. More specifically, we can calculate the time window equal to the length minus width divided by speed. So this time window measure is equivalent to the index of difficulty in Fitz experiments. The smaller the time window, the more difficult the hitting task. So, if there is a true parallel to Fitt's law, we should see slower movement times with more difficult tasks. In this case, shorter time windows. Is this what was found? No. Similar to Fitt's original study, Trezillian measured movement times for various combinations of these variables and found exactly the opposite pattern. People consistently produce faster, shorter duration movements when the temporal window is smaller. So there seems to be some inconsistency here. Fitt's work shows that a movement's spatial accuracy and precision is better when it's of longer duration, leading to the type of speed versus accuracy trade-off described by Fitt's law. Temporal accuracy and precision, by contrast, is better for movements of shorter duration. Thus, spatial and temporal accuracy seem to place conflicting demands on performance, making longer duration movements when spatial accuracy is required and briefer movements when temporal accuracy is required. What happens when both spatial and temporal accuracy are varied? Trezillian has done these experiments too, and found that performers essentially ignore changes in the spatial accuracy demands when hitting a moving target, as there's no systematic change in movement time. Instead, they seem to again follow the basic pattern of using shorter movement time, faster movements when the temporal precision required is higher. So what is going on here? Trezillian has proposed there are a few different factors at play. First, think about hitting a completely stationary target very accurately. When there are no timing demands, only spatial, it makes sense to move more slowly for two reasons. First and foremost, Moving more slowly allows you to take advantage of visual feedback. 
That is, once you start moving your hand or the implement, you can perceive the gap between it and the target, listen back to my episode on coupling tows from last week, and use this to continually adjust your movements online. Second, slower movements are less physically demanding and have less of a metabolic cost. But now what happens when the target starts moving? In this case, there are a few reasons why moving faster might be better. If the target is moving very quickly, it's likely you're going to have to also move your bat or your hand very quickly too. So there's not likely going to be enough time to use visual feedback to continuously adjust your movement online. Research has shown it takes about 150 to 200 milliseconds for a visually detected error in movement to even start having an effect on an ongoing movement. By comparison, typical baseball swings only last 150 to 200 milliseconds. So there's really not much time to do much with visual feedback. Second, if you use a faster movement, you can wait and view the target longer before movement initiation, thus giving you more time to process visual information about its trajectory. This is like the advantage baseball players with quick bat speed have. The fact that they can move faster allows them to view a pitch longer. Finally, it has been shown that faster open loop movements tend to be more controllable and accurate because there's less time for internal noise in the motor system and external disturbances to affect performance. So in a nutshell, the spatial and temporal demands of a movement task seem to have very different effects on performance. When people do not need to be accurate temporally, they move relatively slowly, and such movements are well described by Fitt's law. However, when you need to be accurate temporally, you make a faster, more effortful movement. Finally, before I finish today, I wanted to connect this with some real sporting tasks. What I've been talking about so far are trade-offs between movement time and movement accuracy. But of course, as I've alluded to at the beginning of the episode, there are other trade-offs we see in sport. For example, the classic speed accuracy trade-off in throwing. How does this compare to Fitz's findings? In a paper published in 2014, Freeston and Rooney asked 20 grade-level cricket and baseball players to perform a series of throwing tasks the cricket players throwing at a stump, and the baseball players throwing at a circular target. To vary speed, participants were asked to make throws at 70, 80, 90, and 100% of their maximum throwing speed. What was found? For both groups, there was a linear increase in throwing error as a function of speed. For example, for baseball players, the error was roughly 40 centimeters on average when throwing at 70%, while it was close to 60 centimeters when throwing at 100%. So this task which of course is emphasizing spatial accuracy, does seem to follow the basic pattern of Fitz's law. Okay, that's it for the first episode of this series looking at Paul Fitz. Next time, I will turn to his work on motor learning, taking a deep dive into Fitz's three-stage model of skill acquisition. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode and written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. The newest bonus episode concerns recent research on focus of attention. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. We'll cut you quick.